the theme that I'm going to emphasize today when we talk about reinventing the warehouse and reimagining the supply chain is a very good fit with any logic because the, the, uh, the unifying theme of any logic is it's a very flexible tool with various types of modeling paradigms that you can integrate together. And what we found it to be a very good tool that allows us to build models at various levels, uh, at, at a robotic level, a warehouse level, and a supply chain level. So I'll be covering those in the, uh, in the presentation today. Um, there's probably no, uh, no area of robotics that has captured more media attention than the investment that Google and Amazon have made, uh, spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars in robotics companies. And at the same time, the companies that uh, Amazon and Google compete against are now um, uh, scrambling to try and figure out how do, how do they compete in this new world of e-commerce, next day delivery, maybe even delivered before you even know you're going to order the product. So you see this kind of thing, this kind of thing uh, advertised in the news uh, every day. And so what's driving that investment? And basically what's happening is a proliferation of products. Uh, in, the, in the jargon of uh, logistics, we talk about a SKU, a stock keeping unit. It's basically many, many more products the warehouses, distribution systems, supply chains are having to deal with. And if you are running a logistics system, you run out of space. You don't have a place to store all of this material, and it's getting increasingly difficult to find people that are willing to, to pick it. It's very, uh, very arduous labor. So uh, over the last, let's say, 25 years, an automation industry has developed, primarily coming out of Europe, where the labor costs, ergonomic restrictions, and space are, are more demanding than we experience typically here in the US. And so these made largely German or Dutch-based companies have developed automation solutions. These are examples on this page that show you what these systems look like. Um, you can easily spend 50 to $100 million on a system, uh, which may include having to build a, a dedicated new greenfield building to, uh, to house this equipment. That's a lot of money to spend on an automated warehouse. Uh, especially since these supply chains typically run at very, very tight margins. Uh, the other problem with this type of system is it's very inflexible. You design it for a specific application. Once you put it in, you've got uh, uh, literally maybe six, six kilometers of conveyors inside the building. If your business model changes, maybe going from one that's predominantly store replenishment to e-commerce, you now have a system that's very difficult to change. So what's happening right now is there's a classic case of disruptive technology change that's occurring in the industry. I'd say three years ago when I attended industry uh, groups in the material handling industry, they were just beginning to pay attention to mobile robots. And now, uh, three weeks ago, I was in San Diego for the executive conference, and they were saying customers are demanding mobile robot solutions. They're asking for mobile robot solutions. So in an industry that traditionally took 25 years to come up with a new innovation, that is a, a very rapid change. So what I'm showing here are some examples. Um, on the left is, is Domatic from Germany. On the upper right is Kiva, which was acquired by Amazon about three years ago for over $700 million. And then our systems, um, our mobile robots are on the bottom. So I'm going to talk more about uh, what this mobile robot technology is designed to do, and then how did we apply any logic uh, to do our simulations. So the very first priority that we found in the marketplace is maximizing the storage density in the warehouse. And uh, if we go back to the earlier slide where I say people are running out of space, well, how do you deal with space? You store things more densely. So the Kiva system, which is shown in the upper left, it was an innovation at its time, but it was basically a two-dimensional system. So the mobile robots ran around on the floor, but it made, did make use of the full three-dimensional space of the, of the warehouse. So that was a problem. Our system, the symbiotic system in the middle, is a full, fully three-dimensional system. It goes all the way to the ceiling. And not only that, we go even further, is that we do not, we do not use fixed storage locations or parking spaces for the products. We use variable density storage, so it's like a disk drive. Is we, we put the packages as close together on the shelves as we can. To do that, the robots that you're gonna see later can position the cases to within a few millimeters on the shelves. 
And basically one of the primary limitations we have of how close we can get the cases together is the inaccuracy of the packaging themselves. If you're importing products from China, sometimes the packaging comes in in pretty poor condition, the cases bulge out. But basically within that limitation, we get the cases as close together as we can. So that was priority number one. Priority number two is what we call high-speed sequencing. So uh, many of the competitors that are trying to get into this space they have what we call a shuttle. It's a mobile robot, but it only runs up and down one aisle. And so it's dedicated and captured. And then they have to have some kind of a vertical lift at the end. And it's very difficult for them to be able to get high throughput coming out of that system in the exact sequence that you want. So what is the exact sequencing all about? Well, in the upper left-hand corner is a, pic a picture from a typical grocery store. So you want to deliver a pallet of mixed products to that aisle with all, those, all the products from that aisle together. So simply stated, the ketchup, pickles, and mayonnaise all should be on the same pallet, and the baby food and cleanser should be on a different pallet and in a different aisle to minimize the labor in the store. So if you want to build a pallet that looks like that, and the, in the upper right-hand corner are examples of that, you want to build the pallets that have all the products from the same aisle put together. You also want to build a pallet that's stable, doesn't going to fall over, and it's dense. And finally, you want to make sure that the ramen noodles end up on the top and the cans of soup end up on the bottom for, for crushability reasons. If you talk to a computer science professor, he'll tell you that that is an NP-hard problem. Even just the, the geometric part of it is NP-hard. And so very few people have actually solved that problem successfully. Once you've solved that problem, you now, if you want to build those pallets robotically, which I'll show you in a few minutes, you need to send the cases to that robot in exactly the right sequence. And so that's where sequencing comes into play. So in the bottom picture, what I'm showing is think about if you had the products stored on a level, and let's say all of the products that go into sequence number one are the, are the red ones, they're coming out on top. And let's say you're trying to have another robot at the same time do the same thing, you get the sequence on the bottom. But at the same time, I wanna be bringing products into the system. So this is just a snapshot of what the problem looks like in two dimensions. Think about if this is try you're trying to do this in three dimensions. So to do that, we've developed mobile robots. And these are a fully autonomous mobile robots. I gave this a talk uh, with some of the same slides about three weeks ago at Stanford to the robotics lab. So these are the kinds of things that you want a mobile robot to do. You want it to know where it is, how to navigate around freely, how to sense the environment, how to sense the, the task, the products it's going to handle due to the product, and then when, if it runs into trouble, how to recover automatically. So those are very, very complex robotic behaviors. So the next step is, um, is to capture that behavior inside an AnyLogic simulation model. We, we tried about two years ago using AnyLogic 6, we tried to do that unsuccessfully. It was just too complicated. We basically, we had to hardwire too much of the behavior into, into flow charts, flow diagrams. And um, if you wanted to consider different scenarios, different cases, it got to be very, very cumbersome. So any Logic 7 was, a, was really a benefit uh, for us. Um, what's interesting is that some of the newer employees we had who were not familiar with any logic before learned this very quickly. And the people like myself who had been using AnyLogic 6 for several years, it took us a, a, about a month to actually get used to uh, uh, using the product in a new way instead of the old way. So that state diagram that we have that I show there is, uh, has a lot of our behaviors that we build into, uh, into the model, but we do this as, as obviously as an agent. And so the next step is we're gonna do this uh, hundreds of times, is if we have hundreds of mobile robots in our system, we build systems as, as many as 500 robots in practice uh, so having all of these behaviors and have them operate all at the same time and have the, the computation scale up in an efficient way is very, very impressive to us. So we're pleased with, we can endorse the, the, the properties of AnyLogic 7 from that regard. Now, in, when we started doing this work, initially we were coming in and saying, okay, come into your warehouse and we'll automate this part of what was being done manually. Now we're going to do it with robots. What happens is that we now had capability that the customers realized could transform the warehouse, totally change the way you run the warehouse. So they started asking us, could we simulate these uh, different ideas they had to make their warehouses better? So we started to apply any logic in that domain. 
So one of the examples here is uh, in, in looking at the, the simulation of a full warehouse, we found AnyLogic, again, to be very powerful for us. So uh, one, of the, one of our research scientists who was here at the INFORMS conference um, put this slide together for me. And, and what we have here is we have a number of resources that are fixed assets. So these would be like dock doors and uh, forklift trucks. These are things that are fixed assets. You have a certain number of them available to you. And then we use agents to, that we create dynamically. So when an order comes in, um, or, or either a replenishment um, shipment is coming in or an order is going out, this will generate a certain number of orders, certain number of pallets, um, and, we, sub, and, 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 and the, we have layers and layers of, of uh, dynamic generation in a very, very flexible way. So this is a very interesting capability of the warehouse that, um, that we enjoy. This is a screenshot. I'm not going to show an animation of this, but it's a screenshot of the, of the, uh, of the warehouses that we're uh, simulating. In addition to the, uh, the flexibility of doing the programming in Enlogic 7, What's very, pow very powerful for us is every customer's warehouse is different. And so it, it takes us a relatively short amount of time from, to go from one warehouse model to another or to adapt uh, the operating procedures of a particular customer. We're able to do that fairly quickly. And when we tried to do that in the past with any Logic 6, it, took a, it was a lot less intuitive as what was going on. And we found out that the, uh, and we're finding that it's a lot easier to, to extend this to, uh, to other models. The last thing I'll point out is that now we're going beyond uh, talking about how do we reimagine or reinvent the warehouse. We're talking about how do we change the supply chain. If I, what I've told you so far is that our warehouses we're building are much denser. In fact, they are so dense that some of our customers are combining two warehouses into one. If you can do that, then the ROI on that investment becomes very, very attractive, even more attractive. And if you, if you have a compact warehouse and it takes very few people to run it, now you can change where the, lo where the warehouse is located. You can bring a warehouse and put it directly into an urban area. So that cuts down on transportation costs. And, and more importantly, it gives you the flexibility for, for next day or same day delivery. Uh, you may have noticed that in the, in the newspaper about two weeks ago, Amazon uh, announced their first storefront in Manhattan and a, uh, and a warehouse uh, in, the, uh, in the metropolitan area to supply it. Now, what we've, what we've heard is the number of SKUs they can handle is very limited. But it, it, it's created shockwaves through the logistics industry to think about the idea of bringing that next day delivery or same day delivery to the customer. If, um, just to give you a concrete example, the warehouse I showed you at the beginning was located in Newburgh, New York, which is about halfway between New York and Albany. It's closer to Albany. And they ship from that warehouse all the way out onto Long Island. There are no warehouses on Long Island because the land is very, very expensive and it's very hard to find people on Long Island that are willing to do this work. So think about the transformation you could make by bringing warehouses much closer or even into the urban area. So now you're really talking about transforming the whole supply chain. So with that, um, the last thing I'd like to put in is, uh, is uh, we are growing company. Uh, a few weeks ago, I showed this slide at Stanford, and I already found a, a, a person who wants uh, from the robotics lab who's interested in an interview. He's coming on Monday. If there are people here that are, are excited about this field and are interested in, in uh, joining our team, please uh, see me during the reception later or at, or at the break. Um, we uh, were recognized last year with an Edison Award for uh, productivity. It's one of the top awards in the U.S. for innovation. Um, and we can only be as successful as the, uh, as the quality of the team members we have, so I welcome your uh, interest in the company. So with that, I'm ready for questions. So uh, even though the warehouses are, to, uh, I, I would think 100% uh, automation is there, but do you still need uh, human operators to oversee um, robots and uh, my second question is, uh, um, do you have uh, the robots in the, uni uh, in the warehouse, are, all, are, all of, are they all the same or you can have like different uh, robots? And okay, uh, two good questions. So first, um, we've, lear we, we've learned some lessons from the time we built our first system to later. So one of the problems we had to, to solve was if the robot got stuck, of having to have a person go into the system uh, to, to rescue the robot. 
So part of the problem was to make the robots more reliable. The biggest problem we have is the poor quality of the packaging. It wasn't the, the robots, I think, have an MTBF of uh, between five and 10,000 hours. So the robots are very reliable, but the task they have to do is, is challenging. So that's why we had to add to the robustness of the product, I mean, of, of the, the robot being able to handle the product. Um, I think, on, you know, on a per shift basis, an average size system might only require about eight people to run a system with hundreds of robots in it. So that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty low. The other thing we learned is that some of the products are actually too difficult to handle robotically. And so we've backed off on trying to do 100% of the products. So maybe we'll do 70 or 80% of the products, and then we'll have another path into the system that will bypass some of the robotic uh, uh, automation, and they'll be handled manually. But we do it in an ergonomic way. So part of we, we're learning what's the balance of people and robots uh, in the system. Uh, with regard to your uh, second question about the robots all being the same, um, initially, basically, uh, we've gone through eight generations of robots. Um, the first five were all development. The version six was the first one that went in production. So the videos I'm showing you are actually two generations old with regard to the, um, to the robots. And we're increasing the capabilities with regard to um, how, the, how the products are handled. So the, the basic chassis has stayed the same. We've just made it, the, made it more reliable, more robust, you know, and more efficient. But the, the, case, the handling part of it is, and the sensing part has become more sophisticated. Uh, so for the human part, the, the operator that manages the system, uh, do they need, I guess, do you need a sophisticated type of skills compared to the manual system to, uh, to have people operating the robots? So do, do you, how this fits in the business model that you're presenting to the company? Well, it's a very good question. When, when, you, when you think about the, uh, the labor savings, uh, which is part of the business equation. You're thinking about, I'm, I'm saving all this direct labor over here, but I'm having to add technical people over here. Um, what we've learned is we've put a huge investment in software. Our, our company right now is about 200 people, and I'd say about two-thirds of them, no, so yeah, two-thirds are in software, and about one-third are in, in mechanical and electrical. The part of the company that's growing the fastest is the part that's going out and deploying these systems, so there's a tremendous amount of software. An example is we have fleet management software that connects to all the robots that's monitoring their condition all the time. Uh, when it's time to bring a robot out for preventive maintenance, which is, uh, let's say, two or three times a year, um, we'll measure the wheel wear, for example, and we'll bring it out. We plug it in just like you would uh, go to a, a, a car dealer and plug in and get a di complete diagnostic. So we've evolved a lot of the software tools to help you manage the automation in an effective way. Initially, we had uh, a lot of very, uh, let's say we had degreed engineers having to run the system, and now we've gotten to the point where we can recruit, go into a, ge a geography, let's say whether it's California or Virginia or Pennsylvania, and go and recruit in the local market for people that have more conventional automation skills. We've also been able to take some of the people who used to be operators on the manual side of the warehouse and train them to do some of the tasks here, which was very good for the, from a people acceptance standpoint. And we benefited because they had a lot of experience. For example, they knew how to build pallets. And so some of the features that they advised us got incorporated into the software. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.